All right, perfect. Well, let's get started. Um, welcome to Practical Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence, the Future, and You. Uh, let's start with a little bit about myself. Well, start with a little disclaimer. This presentation makes heavy use of the design ideas function in PowerPoint, so slides may look a little interesting, but that's pretty decent because otherwise they'd look like pretty much every presentation you've ever seen. So uh, get ready for some excitement and jazzed up things a little. So who is CXI? A little bit about me, I'm CXI. I'm the founder of Remediate Security, a vulnerability and scanning and security remediation company, 12 year VMware V expert, author of seven books, numerous papers, including 10 ways to reduce costs while modernizing your IT, peer storage, global influencer, and a number of other evangelists and VIP programs. But that's really, there, there's just a little bit about me. A little bit of my background though is um, prior to starting Remediate Security, I was CTO at a tech company and reseller for five years. And before that, I spent two years in Afghanistan running theater-wide infrastructure operations taking the environment from an average 30% uptime to 100% uptime for 600 plus days, and a number of other fun accomplishments that we're not going to get into today. <clears throat> Instead, we're going to focus on the most important thing here is the things we're going to talk about. What I'm going to bring to you are tales of intrigue about machine learning and artificial intelligence, some fun anecdotes and direct examples that might resonate with you, as well as ways that you can get started playing with machine learning and artificial intelligence in your personal and professional lives. And that's kind of the one, some of the key parts around there, ways that you can apply this as opposed to just becoming educated about it. What I'm not going to be talking about is anything involving viruses or anything that's going on in, the, in that space. A lot of people have talked about it. We don't need to talk about it right now. Let's get down and dirty into some really fun and interesting stuff. So this pretty much sums every machine learning and artificial intelligence discussion I've ever seen at once. Um, if you don't understand what's going on, you might be a data scientist. If you do understand what's going on, you also might be a data scientist, but that's okay. You don't need to really understand everything that's, that's going on in the entire space in order to be successful, in order to do you know, great and gracious things, which is good because we can kind of dig into the depth on that. So one key part is why often AI isn't AI is because when people say AI, typically, usually I'll say AI with air quotes, they mean machine learning. Just like when they say blockchain, they really mean database. Database, they really mean NoSQL. When they, machine, when they say machine learning, they really mean heuristics built upon human biases. Because that's kind of the key around a lot of machine learning growth, depth, knowledge. And you'll see it show up a lot in the press and a lot of implementations is machine learning ethics, the good and the bad. What we are not going to be discussing here is machine learning ethics. If you want to you know, know some good depth on, uh, on, on ethics around AI and ML, feel free to watch my machine learning ethics uh, video I have there, um, which uh, everything's cited in the end, so you can go and find these things. But the key part is we're not here to talk about ethics. We're talk here to talk about things that you can accomplish, things that you can do so you can kind of move forward. So machine learning and destroying the library of Alexandria. <clears throat> For those who aren't familiar with the Library of Alexandra, it was a place of wonder. It held so much knowledge, documentation, and so much, and it was destroyed. When I was preparing for this topic, I wanted to find some destructions that occurred over the years. And some notable events I had found was 200 years worth of artifacts destroyed in a, a, a fire in Brazil. This is within the last few years. Uh, the very recent Notre Dame fire, which caused massive devastation there inside of the, that cathedral. And all the artifacts, libraries, and, and sculptures, and other uh, items that were destroyed by ISIS when they went you know, rampant throughout various countries. Um, this image depicts a comet disaster that broke off and destroyed a sleepy little village, and then 1,200 years later did the same again. It happened in a movie, but that kind of speaks well to the, the story that we're going to get into here. Uh, which are the inspirations of T. Kasasagi and everything that she's been doing in the ML world, setting it on fire around evolutionary changes and translation of ancient Edo era and um, Curse of Hiragana. So an interesting point is if all Japanese literature and history researchers started today transcribing all these books, it would take 2,000 years per person. And that's the case of a lot of languages, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of our ancient artifacts 
all the knowledge that we have in the world, it tends to sit there stagnant, waiting for someone to go and do something with it. And this is one of the projects that, uh, that she had actually started working on. In her first epoch, she had found that the, the first time she was working on this, she was able to accomplish, hey, it's able to detect a few characters here. It's not too successful. It got about 50. That's, that, in some cases, might seem kind of successful. And for those who are not familiar with uh, Curse of Hiragana was an Edo era version, which differs from modern day Hiragana today. Thus, if you don't know that ancient Edo era version of it, you wouldn't be able to read any of those modern texts today. And today only a handful of people could actually read, transcribe and translate them. Yet there's thousands upon thousands, well, millions of documents that exist. So in a short amount of time, she was able to get it to where it translated from this, just a few characters showing, to getting this, which is pretty impressive considering doing this by hand would take as much as a, a few weeks possibly as well. <clears throat> now, it may seem like a justifiable growth and this model reached the point of 99% accuracy at this point, which is pretty impressive when working within this very complicated and difficult to understand series of information. But then that kind of moved into this and it continued to rinse and repeat over and over. Uh, I'd say definitely check out these stories that T. Kasasagi has been going. She's been sharing these adventures in real time, going through the evolutions and the learning uh, and the advancements in technologies using like natural language processing, computer vision, and convolutional neural networks. And it's able to, it's grown this entire industry in this space. It's pretty, pretty exponentially powerful. When you consider just a few years ago, just using a translation app inside of something like Google Translate or for anyone who remembers Babelfish from Alta Vista and anything like that, it was, well, we can say bad. It was really bad for a very long time. And still to this day, it is, leaves a lot to be desired. But even in just a few years, that has transformed and significantly changed. Uh, I found that today, modern era, Google Translate does a, an okay job while trying to translate Japanese or Chinese, whereas something like WeChat, uh, its natural conversion of Chinese into English is actually pretty impressive. So we're leap years beyond where we were a few years ago, and it's going to continue getting better. <laughs> and some of this has been powered exponentially by machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the works and efforts that the teams has been going on to. But kind of rolling into how can we apply this from a business standpoint or why businesses don't want machine learning or artificial intelligence. <laughs> so the key part is every business says we want ML, we want AI, but the, the truth is not necessarily. So I'm sure looking at this image, as well as the fact that it's labeled, you might be able to tell that's, that's a hot dog. It's probably a hot dog. There's a good chance it's absolutely a hot dog. So last year, um, we actually had tested going through this. Uh, it was a, and we called this an innocuous meat enclosure, and we ran it through the paces of all of the, tr all of the top four favorite cloud AI and ML platforms to give us some insight on how the machines are working and, and what they're doing. And the findings we found from this are kind of pretty significant. I mean, we can, we can all agree or disagree on different parts on this, but we'll kind of see how, how it comes to bear, right? So we asked Google, hey, Google, what is this? And I'll tell you, I mean, if you look at it, you might say, that's pretty good. I mean, short of Google coming out and saying, this is a hot dog, it was kind of spot on. You know, it's a sausage, it's a bockwurst, it's a kibasa, it's a breakfast sausage, right? We can all agree Google did a pretty good job there. You know, and it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not unlike Google because they have indexed so much of our content, so much of our images, so much of our data in the world. I would hope that they would know that this is a hot dog. But instead of Google, you know, forget about Google. I'm, I'm a Microsofty through and through, you know, I bleed Azure. So let's forget about Google. You know, I, I only care about my platform of choice because it's got to be Microsoft and Azure, right? Because that's what we're using. So, so let's peel back the, the, 
chop white onion and dig into the tags a little bit. Microsoft has just pegged pretty heavy in its confidences. And I can say, I can't agree more with a 95% accuracy that Microsoft can unequivocally say without a doubt that this is a carrot, right? We're done here. We didn't talk anymore. Obviously, this is a carrot. So when 4th of July rolls around, you know, or, or, or your favorite summer holiday, let's make sure we throw some carrots on the barbecue and get ready, right? I mean, there's a little bit of hyperbole in here because at least with 94% accuracy, they can say that it's hot, right? You a little less confidence that's carrot stick. They're pretty sure that it's orange. <laughs> so we, we found that maybe, just maybe, machine learning is not always equal in every case, as we can kind of tell from the fact that Google, pretty sure this is sausage. Microsoft, pretty sure this is a carrot. I mean, if you look down, if you dig a little down into the tags, you'll find that um, just briefly there with a 41% level of confidence that this is bread. So they're, they're in the right area. They're definitely getting the right sense of things, but that's kind of the case is we're only as good as our data. And it's not to say that Microsoft necessarily has good data, but um, they're not sure what a hot dog is. <clears throat> but let's cast Microsoft aside for a moment because Everybody here uses Amazon. Everyone is all about AWS, right? We're all AWS junkies. It's my platform of choice, right? I mean, I just said that about Azure, but the, the key is it is a platform of choice for many organizations. One uh, type of organizations, for example, were police departments were leveraging for facial recognition technology. So to profile criminal acts, actions, and to do better policing, right? So we're hopeful that, uh, Amazon might do a better job at trying to understand this image than they would be profiling people's images and criminal acts and things that are going on. But, but for a moment, I wanna take a step back and we wanna dig into some details for a moment, right? Um, does everyone here like smoothies? I mean, I, I know I do. In fact, one of my favorite drinks is the Asahi Super Antioxidant from Jamba Juice. So I have a business opportunity for you here is between you, me, and Amazon, we're gonna get together and we're gonna put together a smoothie store so we can put all these other businesses uh, completely out of business. Who's with me? Because the first thing you might notice here is Amazon's really good at knowing that this is a confectionery sweet food. We can call the caramel dessert. So we can get our robots, our machine learning, our artificial intelligence, all those things together to run a storefront for us and they'll go into the refrigerator pull this little thing out there and they'll make an orange smoothie for somebody. And I'm sure they will enjoy, enjoy these wonderful hot dog smoothies because um, I certainly know that I will. The key is, I mean, this, you may find this to be a little bit humorous as I certainly do, is um, do businesses really want machine learning? And the key is, yes, they do. But the truth is, no, they don't. Businesses don't want machine learning or artificial intelligence. They want machine fact. They don't want it to be out there on the job trying to figure out for the first time, what is this thing? Oh, it's a hot dog, it's a carrot, I don't know. It's probably, it's, it's gotta be orange. This is clearly an orange. <laughs> Businesses want when they're going and uh, running a plasma pump, for example, it needs to distribute type O positive blood to someone. They want to go and grab the type O positive blood type and go and distribute that to people. They want when it's looking for faults on a supply line to actually go and identify and see those faults because they have a history of known information and good information they're working on. They don't want a 60% guess that this, is a, that this is a sweet food. So the key on there is that, that while every business may say they want it, they actually want it to work really, really, really well <laughs> as opposed to a, a modicum of, of its, uh, some sense of functionality. Right? They, they prefer 99.99999% accuracy, which actually is a high level of failure when you're considering at scale. But that's a lot better than a 98% confidence that Google had that it was a hot dog, which did a pre pretty decent job for what it's worth. So this brings us to the point of where a business is able to identify and accept certain tolerances of what they're happen to be going through. And mind you, it sometimes doesn't affect us, right? The accuracy of machine learning has skyrocketed in years, but it doesn't necessarily always affect us. But through this investment and these advancements, we found that the, 
we've gotten better, faster, smaller TPUs, GPUs, VPUs. Uh, for some of those terms that you guys might not be familiar with, we'll kind of dig into it a little bit here. Google unveiled these tiny AI chips for on-device machine learning. That is a US penny, which is very small. It's very difficult to be able to see the, the TPUs here when actually used to scale. But the point is that little chip itself is a very, very powerful uh, TPU. For those not familiar, a TPU is a tensor processing unit. Uh, if, if you're familiar with a CPU being a central processing unit, GPU being the graphics processing unit, a TPU being a tensor processing unit is designed for machine learning type functions or for uh, tensor processing type capabilities. <coughs> it gives us the ability to be driven hard towards the functions of machine learning type uh, technology, capability, and function. So, Rather than having servers, workstations, all these machines work very hard while using these not or generally purpose designed equipment such as CPU and GPUs, these TPUs are designed to function very specifically and very powerfully in order to go and solve these things to the point of you can have these things and use them in, an, in a remote capacity. You can embed these anywhere into, into devices. I've seen these used in drones for real-time analysis of data that happens to be going out in the field. But we came here to talk about hot dogs, didn't we? So you had, the last one in our picture was IBM Watson, the premier cloud provider when it comes to businesses. And I feel like we can all agree that Watson is in the carrot stick business. So it's, we have, we've got choices. We've got options of what we want to use, what, what platform we want to use. One platform is not necessarily better than the other, although you might find Google probably is going to work better in the, the uh, uh, machine learning and AI space, even though Amazon and, and uh, Azure tend to tout themselves as the absolute best in the, that space. But I mean, for what it's worth, all of the advancements and technologies that we've seen that have really come to market through TensorFlow, which we'll cover in a little more detail later, <coughs> have all come out of internal Google projects and operations that have kind of allowed us to jump and advance this far. But let's change topics here a little bit and talk about the future, because the future is now. Because we're literally living in the future. Has anyone sat in a car that was gonna drive for itself and it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, what we've kind of seen here is self-driving vehicles. <clears throat> and self-driving vehicles are pretty impressive in what they can do. They do a pretty decent job. I mean, not hot dog quality job, but nonetheless, they do a pretty good job. And some of you may like Tesla. Some of you may love Tesla. And I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I don't drive one, but I'm a fan. Um, but rather than having that, you know, fanboy or fan hate that people have, um, we kind of live in a future where robots are going to be helping and enabling us or robots are maybe going to kill us, right? Because is, is the Tesla autopilot safe? Absolutely. Definitely. Except for when it's not, it's spot on, perfectly safe. This right here was an anomaly. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. What it sees here is, you may notice that... Um, it says, this is a clear path, we can go that way. So at the time, this was analyzing that, and it saw the undercarriage of this tractor trailer as an overpass. And you can drive under an overpass, right? Uh, unfortunately, not very good. This happened in March of 2019. Not a good thing to happen. Um, fortunately, this person was able to you know, identify that and not drive through that space. Unfortunately, several years prior to this, the same exact um, incident occurred, except it resulted in a shearing or we'll call it loss of life. We'll go with the easy route, loss of life. <laughs> so these things are absolutely not perfect, but they're learning. They're constantly going through and trying to learn because they're only as good as the amount of data they have, right? Just like ELDA is not your friend. Um, and uh, so ELDA is the thing that will go and detect, hey, um, the lane drift, uh, you know, lane drift detection. And we've found that even if you don't have self-driving vehicles turned on, uh, you're driving any run-of-the-mill car that has ELDA, you may find that sometimes it says, hey, you're drifting into a different lane. Yes, uh, and that's without machine learning or artificial intelligence. And you'll find a lot of times it works very horribly because the fact of the matter is roads are dirty, 
roads have a lot of bad data points. They're definitely not designed as the premier location for information to be, you know, ingested from, be it from camera, be it from uh, laser, LIDAR, or anything like that. So we find that in some cases, it's, it's not exactly perfect. Okay, in most cases, it's not exactly perfect, but it's working, it's learning, it's growing from this information, from being able to work out of all of this. But we need to go into it knowing that our information is not necessarily good. But the question is, is autonomous driving safe? Well, we've had 60, 70, 80, 100 or so. That's specifically incurred from self-driving vehicles in the past five, six years. And on average, there's a 1.3 million road deaths every year worldwide. When you kind of aggregate that and you kind of roll it together, um, some people like any loss of life is bad. That's what they say. We can't have self-driving cars because if they allow or tolerate any loss of life, it's a terrible thing that we cannot accept in any capacity. But so which life is more important than another? Then you factor it against 1.3 million people die, but any but 10 is also really bad. So I know it's kind of weighing it one way or the other uh, because is autonomous driving safe? It's not perfect. Absolutely is not perfect. Is it safer than 1.3 million road deaths per year? Yes, without a doubt. Because it may seem like I was, I was you know, nagging against and was kind of uh, uh, against the direction of self-driving vehicles. I don't have a self-driving vehicle today. However, I do recognize how it is far more efficient than regular people on the roads. People who may be tired, sleepy, or just reckless and dangerous because all those things do happen. So how do self-driving cars work? Honestly, it all comes down to one thing. The future is telemetry. <clears throat> They're leveraging LIDAR, they got GPS, they've got radar sensors, they've got cameras, they've got ultrasonic sensors and more. And they're only using a finite number of these and you find that you can always add to that. You can always add more of those devices because if you find that um, a self-driving car might not have noticed this until it was too late, but your own eyes might see, wow, there's, um a mountain falling down on, on front of us, let's stop now. So having more points of telemetry or more eyes into things are, are very important. And for what that's worth, one of the greatest pieces of telemetry that, and data that's not directly fed into any self-driving vehicle are your own eyes and your own ability to observe knowledge and information. And that's where things like this kind of come into play is you have the vehicle that's got all of its knowledge, all of its information, all of its interactive capabilities, and then you've got yourself and saying, you know what, I need to react in addition to what other pieces of information I'm seeing because they haven't invested further in more points of telemetry, more cameras looking in more directions that can provide us, you know, another way of looking at it because anything that's above the line of the car, as far as the most AI that lives inside cars is concerned, doesn't even exist. So you might be asking yourself with all these little gems, how, can you get started? <laughs> what are some ways that you can kind of, you know, get rolling into things? Because for what it's worth, it, it's a gigantic ocean of things you can kind of choose. So let's take this chance and this moment to celebrate the, the power of what we found in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And let's get down to brass tacks of how we can start building and start working with this and work from scratch. So that way we don't actually have to try to boil the ocean or try to swim the ocean just to find something that's going to be beneficial or useful because we want to find ways we can use this in our daily, you know, personal or professional lives. And I bring out personal just because your business may not say, you know, oh, we don't see a, a, a direction in using that, but you may find a way you can make your daily jobs significantly easier or your daily personal pursuits significantly easier by leveraging stuff here. So one of the first projects we have here, and maybe not something that you're going to take advantage of immediately, is Deepmoji. It's an artificial emotional intelligence uh, sentiment analysis type uh, thing. So this is leveraging AI. <laughs> it may not seem too sophisticated, but the point is this is an open source project that you can get on GitHub and start working with today. So if you wanted to... Uh, implement and sentiment analysis into your own content. So that way you could have something come back and say, you know what, I think you're kind of angry right now. Or, or something that's feeding into information that's going on in some type of workflow system inside of your workplace. 
you've got options. But the key part is you've got options that you don't have to invent from scratch. This is something you can pick up and play with. Something you can try out and say, hey, is this something that's going to benefit me? Is this something that's going to be fun? And if you don't like it, you can discard it. It's that easy. The next one here is move mirror AI experiment. Again, maybe not something you're necessarily going to do, but this gets you into understanding and working with these projects. This will use your own camera and your movements to match body movements it's found from other images. <laughs> now that might sound like I have no practical application to use something like this. But the key is, if you're able to have the camera go and analyze information such as a shape of something or the movement of a shape of something, you can then feed that into a data table of other information that you have and like, wow, I can actually have this tell when someone's causing a threat inside of a workplace or I've got a you know, fault problem that's going on in a supply line or whatever it happens to be because you can, once you have these things written and powered, they can run on very small footprints and on very small devices. You know. So next thing is Jupyter Notebooks. And I want to be sure to uh, do a special call for uh, Tyler Leonhard on Twitch. He has getting started with Jupyter Notebooks using Docker videos. So you, he's got a number of other videos where you can actually, you don't have to start completely from scratch. You can go and check out some of the content that he's produced and you know, those live streaming and showing you how you can actually get started and you can ask questions and kind of pull through it there. So that way you're able to learn from those experiences as opposed to just going and opening up Jupyter Notebooks. Hey, what's going on? And like, wow, this is so much to take on. I'm not going to do any of it. Just like this, getting started with your first neural network. That's the beginner session. And then it leads into some more advanced sessions. You're going to get all of this if you go to tensorflow.org. These three books, as well as numerous other content, are available immediately for you being able to do things. That's one of, the, one of the really nice pieces around this and this space and this community is the ability for you to actually be practical and be productive immediately. Because there's numerous projects out there that you're able to just pick up and actually work from as opposed to <laughs> trying to figure out what you want to do from nothing and then figure out how to do that from nothing. And then once you start getting your feet wet a little bit and you want to get things a little more down and dirty, uh, there's Kaggle, a place where you can learn how to actually do things as well as compete. For example, there's this deep fake detection challenge. It's a, it's a contest going where people can create a better model that will go and detect deep fake. Um, the winner of that uh, contest will win a million dollars. I've seen a lot of businesses actually fund themselves by going and doing Kaggle competitions. And right now, these are just some of the top ones, you know, 50,000 tends to be like the average on some of these, but there's a lot of competitions people will do where they'll have an idea of something. Hey, we've gone and created this. Is there a better, better model that someone can go and leverage to try and do this? That actually came from, there was a team competing uh, in a Kaggle competition and there was a team of very smart data scientists going creating all these models and going through and, and building this and, and trying to establish something they can go and do and you know work forward for the business. <laughs> and then there was another member of another group of their team who went and they used AutoML from Google. This is not an ad for Google, but they went just use AutoML and paid for it to do an hour of analysis. And they beat the, the other team of people working using their minds yeah, well, they didn't win the competition, but they beat the other members of their team who had spent like 45 days working on the same data set with the same information. So you've got options of how you want to be able to play with this. And another thing noted here is inside Kaggle, you'll find code and data to do your work, which is really nice because there's hundreds of thousands of notebooks where you can just pick up and get started as opposed to, again, trying to do everything from scratch. Now, sometimes you'll find you want to do a lot of this stuff, but you want to do this on your own premises, with your own equipment, with your own hardware. And that's some of, some of the really nice stuff here is Google's got the AIY vision um, with the Myriad VPU. So I mentioned <coughs> CPUs, obviously, GPUs, TPUs, the tensor processing units. And I had actually never heard of the VPUs until I met one of the engineers at Intel working on vision processing or with their VPU, VPU units. And he had this guy who was the engineer behind the neural compute sticks introduced this to me and I'm like, that's pretty amazing. 
So in addition, so there's the Google AIY, there's the Google Coral USB Accel Accelerator, which is really nice because it allows you to take like a Raspberry Pi and you can plug this little thing, it costs like 75 bucks, and it gives you localized, very high performance TPU processing right there plugged into a Raspberry Pi or plugged into a workstation, plugged into some some device, you know, of some sort. I want to do note that these two Intel solutions actually are able to be used um, out of box with Raspberry Pi or Windows. You can actually run these things on Windows. And not pictured here are the NVIDIA Jetson TX2 Nano and other lines, because NVIDIA has a number of kits that you can do. Um, advanced TPU, GPU processing, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence kind of stuff but again, on your own premises, so you can do your kind of own experiments in a little hardware kit unit to be able to uh, play around with and do some very cool and advanced stuff. So some people to follow, uh, I've already mentioned T. Kasasagi. So if anyone happens to be on Twitter or in the internet in general, check out T. Kasasagi. She has, and all the advances she's doing. Dynamic web page, she works with Google AI and the TensorFlow team, and you'll find you'll be able to learn a lot of very cool and very impressive stuff to the point of just from some of the things she was working on, her mom went up and picked up and started training models uh, to do ML related stuff. So it's very powerful. Uh, F. Chalette, who is the creator of Keras, which as you uh, get a little deeper into, is, it's going to be a very powerful resource if you take advantage of it, as well as the Neural Networks Library, author of Deep Learning with Python and a number of other resources. Sue's a tweet, AI Carly and me. I don't actually publicly discuss any of my ML AI projects, but I do share a lot of, a lot of other people's work um, so that people can take advantage of that. And I mentioned uh, Tyler Leonhard earlier uh, on Twitch as well as on Twitter. Definitely check him out and the stuff that he provides. He is an engineer who works at Microsoft and Azure around ML and AI. So it's another resource of uh, so you're not limited or restricted to a single platform because whether you're choosing Amazon, Microsoft, Google, IBM, maybe, um, or Alibaba, Tencent, or any of the other ones, or if you're choosing to do everything at home, you can still do all these things and be very powerful and very capable. Uh, one little non published statistic that I have on here is Google created TensorFlow, and I kind of mentioned that a little bit back here. <laughs> Google created TensorFlow, but 99% of all TensorFlow models run outside of Google. So uh, it's very powerful. A lot of people take advantage of and use it, but they're not always necessarily using it in a Google context. So these things are not limited to a single platform. So there's some more resources of uh, all of the resources I talked about, on uh, uh, various articles that provide a little more depth around some of this. And you can uh, learn a lot more out there. I've got some other resources that are published that are in the notes. Uh, there are a couple of books by uh, Tagliafari, um, as well as Google's got a number of projects going on right now around COVID-19 with pre uh, free public data sets. Um, they've got their hands on uh, ML of, of ML precision recall and predicting pneumonia and x-rays, which there's a good uh, article on that, as well as using vision intelligence API with Python. Uh, again, all these are kind of included inside the notes. Um, but there's a lot of very cool additional resources that you can take advantage of there. And that's me. Thank you, guys. Any questions, feel free to kind of feed those things out. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed and appreciated this. And I was really excited to share this because this is an area that I don't have the chance to talk too often with the exception of when I'm doing it, usually in a business capacity. Um, I've got a, a whole series of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and Aruba Networks. Uh, articles that are coming in the near future. So I'll leave it open for any questions and otherwise I, I wish you guys to really enjoy your morning, afternoon, or evening wherever you uh, happen to be in the world.
we've got a number of questions that are rolling in here. So this is pretty amazing. All right. Um, uh, Anna says, I asked the question of, do you envision more companies turning to AI as a service? And I'll, I'll be honest on that. Um, it depends. So a, a lot of organizations aren't comfortable having any of their data or data sets live outside their premises. So in a lot of those cases, they tend to not leverage AI as a service, uh, even, even in a very raw type of functionality. Um, Whereas another another series of groups of them are really happy to take advantage of it and go you know jump into it wholeheartedly. <laughs> so whether uh, leveraging any of the stuff that happens to be inside the Amazon space, inside the Microsoft space, or the you know open public ones that that Google has had for quite some time, IBM is all about hey we'll do AI as a service you can trust us we're IBM. Remember you're only as good as your you're only as good as your carrot stick. So I mean, if you choose, you choose your battles there respectively, um, but you've got a lot of things that you can necessarily do there in an AI as a service context. It's just a matter of choosing the ones. And I find that choosing more than one and or testing it across them for as low of a dollar footprint as you possibly can is kind of uh, better. For any organization that still doesn't necessarily trust that, that's where they do take advantage of having that on-premises type of equipment or they'll buy whether it being a small footprint of equipment or a massive footprint of equipment from um i forget the name at the top of my head at the moment but some massive multi petaflop scale type units in uh, in what it can actually do and how, the problems it can kind of solve but i find that everyone should really get started on something very small something that they can work with because throwing more resources it just makes it faster so if you can do something like, wow, we're able to accomplish this in a very small data set and we want to grow our data set, you know, tens of millions of times larger, that's great. You'll probably want to leverage something with a lot more footprint. <laughs> but even then, I do find that just like that team that used AutoML to accomplish what they were versus the other team, uh, that, hey, that was basically leveraging an AI as a service type of functionality where you can kind of just get up and get, get started and get going. Because uh, a side that we didn't necessarily discuss throughout all of this is the infrastructure level to maintain this. And for any of us ops types people is um, they tend to, a lot of data scientists just expect to just get up and going and then they'll go and they make changes and something that they got an answer for yesterday with, with zero changes, but then maybe made a, a code change or they change a, a library they're using suddenly gives them a completely different answer the next day. And that's not necessarily a good way to run the business itself. <laughs> uh, John had asked, um, can I talk about Nano and the Jetson TX2? And absolutely. So uh, NVIDIA has, has those appliances. And if you go and you search for NVIDIA Nano or v NVIDIA Jetson TX2, and these are things you can buy on Amazon and other places, you'll find that these are like, uh, like hobbyist kits of things that you can do in a, in a small footprint. And you absolutely can. There's a lot of very cool things you can do because say in the TX2, for example, it includes uh, a little, you know, wireless ear so you can connect that thing to your network over wireless. Uh, it's got a, a little camera sensor in there so you can actually have it go and do some, uh, I'll call it like visual input to go and do some ML type stuff against visual input devices. <laughs> I've, I've actually seen some people that have taken this and they had it um, in the, in the hobbyist type kit, they put this uh, in their business on the line and it was going through and collecting video and collecting photos of, of objects so that they were able to perform some models and some analysis against that. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things that you can really do. And this, the key part around this, just like in a lot of our communities has been, it's been very community centric. So you don't necessarily always have to work in the bubble. A lot of other people have done what you're trying to do and share their learnings, their experience and, um, stuff that they've done so you don't have to reinvent the wheel because a lot of people they will want to go and reinvent their own version of a wheel and you definitely just like the original open source movement is go and pick up something someone else has done and then tweak it to your own purposes and your own uses you know and a lot of times when people do that here they'll go and share this information back out in the case of Jupyter notebooks or in the case of a lot of these these you know I, I don't want to say marketplaces they're more just community workspaces where people are kind of sharing what they're working on what they're doing and that's how a lot of these Kaggle competitions would be created sometimes you know for for fun and and many times for profit and I've seen people you know literally fund their experiments 
by going and doing these competitions with their open resources when they w weren't using it on their actual own, you know, daily work. Um, so you, I'd say I definitely encourage everyone to get started at home with a lot of these things. I actually start playing around with the ability to do these things in your own, uh, own home infrastructure, whether it be, you know, Mac, PC, Linux, or any of the variants in Raspberry Pi, or if you use any of these kind of hobbyist kits, these are all things that you can take advantage of today. And you can advance it further by having powerful GPUs or powerful TPUs and VPUs. <laughs> but you can get started just purely on CPU. It'll be slower, but uh, you're, if you wanna make it faster, you can throw some resources at it and you kind of justify that to yourself unless you already had those resources laying around. Any other questions out there? Otherwise, I'm gonna go and click these things. I really enjoyed the, you know, the, the opportunity and chance to kind of talk with this with you guys because this is a really exciting topic. It's a really exciting form of content in our industry that nobody really talks about that often because it's, it's hard or it's confusing or it's not, that's not my thing. Awesome. Then I wanna thank everybody for coming and I, I think we should probably wrap it up here. Thank you guys so much. You know, this is a wonderful topic to be able to discuss with you guys.